As one of the longest standing luxury brands, Louis Vuitton is the standard of opulent fashion. With a signature monogram that is not only iconic but often replicated, it is easy to see why carrying a Louis Vuitton bag is a status symbol. Dive in with us into the complex history of a company that turned from a purveyor of luggage into a leading luxury brand. Louis Vuitton was born in 1821 to a farmer and a milliner and came from a long-established working-class family in eastern France. Watching them, he grew up understanding the effects of perseverance and a strong work ethic. At the age of 16, he made the decision to walk 292 miles from his hometown to Paris to try and make a new life for himself. When he arrived, the city was in the midst of the industrialization, with current modes of transportation evolving quickly, allowing for longer journeys. With this came an opportunity, the need for sturdy travel pieces. Louis was taken as an apprentice for a successful box maker and packer named Monsieur Marichal. He learned to craft durable containers and how to pack them properly, a well-respected profession at the time. In 1854, years after he had mastered his craft and become well-respected for it, Louis ventured out on his own to open a shop on Rue Neuve de Capuchin. It was here that he began to establish himself as a luggage maker, making custom-designed boxes and later trunks. Then, in 1858, Vuitton designed the first Louis Vuitton steamer trunk. At the time, trunks had rounded tops to allow for water to run off but this did not allow for easy storage. So he introduced flat-topped yet waterproof trunks. Little did he know then that this simple but brilliant idea would lead his company to the billion dollar company it is today. The first of his trunks were outfitted with a gray canvas referred to as the Trianon. It wouldn't be until several decades later that the signature monogram would be printed in. With an expanding business, Louis moved his family and workplace to Anier, where he employed 20 workers to craft his trunks. This only grew with each year. By 1900, he had 100 employees. And in 1914, the company would more than double in size. In 1871, Oyama Iwao became the first recorded Japanese customer ordering a set of luggage while in Paris as a military observer during the Franco-Prussian War. The same war that helped achieve a new milestone left his store in shambles. But Louis Vuitton was not one to give up. Within the next few months, he had his store back up and running. After years of success, Louis began to experiment with the design of his luggage by introducing a new striped canvas pattern in 1876 and later, the still well-known Damier print in 1888. The hand-painted patterns were all to prevent counterfeits. Even in the late 1800s, Louis Vuitton was enough of a status symbol to warrant duplicates. By 1885, the company opened its first store in London on Oxford Street. And in 1886, his son George invented an ingenious locking system with two spring buckles that made it impossible to pick the lock of their trunks, the very same lock that is still used today. After several years of development, his work was patented and George challenged the great Harry Houdini to try and escape from a locked Vuitton trunk. Although Houdini didn't rise to the challenge, it makes George's design effective and undisputed to date. 1892 would prove to be a time of mourning for the family as Louis Vuitton passed away at the age of 70, leaving George to carry on his legacy as the new head of the luxury house. Louis Vuitton's passing influenced his son to once again change the print of their luggage and in 1896 to honor his father, the signature LV monogram was introduced and patterned with LVs, quarterfoils, and flowers. Continuing its road of expansion, that year, George took it upon himself to tour the cities of the United States, like New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago, selling Vuitton products along the way. By 1913, the Louis Vuitton building opened on the Champs-Élysées, the largest travel goods store in the world at the time. 
He also opened stores in New York, Bombay, Washington, London, Alexandria, and Buenos Aires, just as World War I began. Under his direction, success only followed, and the iconic monogram rose to fame among the elite, catching the eye of one of the most established of fashion icons, Gabriel Coco Chanel. In 1925, a dome-shaped handbag made for personal use, rather than travel, was created specifically just for Chanel. It wasn't until 1934 that she allowed the brand to mass-produce the model for the public. For its debut, the bag was redesigned to be more compact and more suited for everyday use. It was dubbed the Squire, until it was renamed the Alma in 1955. The innovation didn't stop there. With the success of its smaller goods, Louis Vuitton expanded its product line to include the Keepall in 1938, Speedy in 1930, and the No in 1931. The demand for these bags was extraordinary. So much so that they are still currently made in a myriad of materials and sizes. In 1936, George passed away, and his son, Gaston Louis Vuitton, stepped up to run the house. During his 50-year tenure, the brand started to use leather in its products and revamped its signature monogram canvas across multiple styles, including the famous cylindrical Papillon in 1966. When Gaston Louis passed in 1970, his son-in-law, Henri Rassemier, took over the reins. Henri recognized the need to expand the footprint of the brand and pushed to open retail locations around the world and soon went public in 1984, at the insistence of Joseph Lafont, the financial director. 1987 saw the creation of LVMH, Moe Chadon and Hennessy, leading manufacturers of champagne and cognac, merged respectively with Louis Vuitton to form the luxury goods conglomerate. This was one of the most significant events in the history of the company and a power move for the house. Within one year, they had their profits increase by nearly 50%, and by 1989, Louis Vuitton opened over 100 stores worldwide. Around 1990, Yves Carcel was appointed president, the first head of the house unrelated to the Vuitton family. It was under his leadership that the brand made major waves in the fashion industry, with its collaborations and innovative remakes of staple pieces. Soon, Louis Vuitton celebrated the 100th anniversary of its Damier print in 1996 by releasing a limited edition version with Vachetta Leather, the Centenaire collection. As they gained popularity in the fashion world, Louis Vuitton had to up their game, so in 1997, they made Marc Jacobs its first creative director. In March of the following year, he designed and introduced the company's first Pret-a-Porter, or ready-to-wear, line of clothing for men and women. In 2001, he helped Stephen Sprouse design a collection of neon graffiti written over the classic monogram canvas. To this day, this is one of the most sought-after collections among serious Louis Vuitton collectors. From here on out, the brand's popularity only grew. Soon people didn't care how much they paid. As long as it has the LV stamp, it was worth every penny. Their products aren't just bags. They are a heritage, a work of art, unmatched in almost every way. Here's a little fact about Louis Vuitton bags. They are both waterproof and completely fireproof. Following the success of the Stephen Sprouse collaboration, Louis Vuitton began steadily to align itself with popular artists and designers. In 2003, Louis Vuitton worked with Takashi Murakami to create the multicolor monogram, the standard monogram print but in 33 colors on either black or white background. Murakami was also responsible for the famous smiling cherry blossom print on the classic monogram. But the brand wasn't as open to collaborations as one might think. In fact, they have sued people for using their logo or products without their permission. Like the artist from Simple Living for painting their handbag or Britney Spears for showcasing their logo in one of her music videos. Louis Vuitton spared no one. As Louis Vuitton continued to thrive, Marc Jacobs decided to step down in 2013 
to focus on his namesake brand with the support of LVMH. It was then that Nicola Gueschieri was appointed as the new artistic director for women's fashion and began to not only foster the current product line, but also expand it. Coming from Balenciaga, it was no surprise that he challenged the classic and fairly tame aesthetic the brand was recognized for and injected an edginess that spoke to a younger generation. Louis Vuitton's product line of handbags continued to grow with multiple limited editions produced each year. Since taking the throne, Nicola did not disappoint. He creates highly sought-after pieces and continues to wow the masses with his innovative and forward-thinking designs. Based on his success, Louis Vuitton appointed another creative genius to take on the men's side of the business, Virgil Abloh who has not only designed stunning new accessories for men, but also introduced pieces that capture the hearts of men and women alike, a rarity for the brand since its inception. With these two men leading the way for this powerhouse, there is no telling what we should prepare to see, but it seems there are no limits. If you enjoyed this video, consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm so more people can see our videos and so that you can be notified when we launch our next video. We try and put out at least one new one per week and as you can imagine, the research and editing alone of these type of videos takes us close to 18 hours. So we would really appreciate it if you could also check out our Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can support our work. We produce over 12 videos per month, so that is literally 8 cents per video. Thank you so much and we'll see you at our next unmasking.